<coughs> just matter. <coughs> I was told how effective they were. I was just assuming it was working. Apologies for that. So we'll start again. Welcome everyone to this meeting of the Business and Housing Policy Committee on Tuesday, the 28th of February 2023, in the Walton Suite of the Winchester Guild Hall. The time is still 6.30. My name is Councillor Bronk and I'm chairperson of the committee. Before we commence, there's some housekeeping announcements as follows. This meeting is being live streamed and will be available on the Council's YouTube channel. Subtitles are available and advice on how to turn this on are set out on our website. If you're joining us online, please do turn your camera and microphone off until and then immediately after your item. Please would everyone ensure that their mobile phones are on silent and in the unlikely event of the near, that it becomes necessary to evacuate the building, the fire alarm will sound. Please follow all of the instructions given to you by our team. I'd also like to welcome members of the public to the meeting this evening, and I'll invite you to come forward when it is time for you to make your contribution. And so turning to the agenda, item one, our apologies and uh, reference to deputy members. Um, we've received the apologies of Councillor Miller and his deputy is joining us this evening, Councillor Brook. At the moment, I think we may well be waiting for Councillor Isaacs and we'll deal with uh, declarations of interest on her behalf when she joins us. Um, in the meantime, item two. Um, oh, sorry, Councillor Horai. <laughs> Welcome you as a full member to the committee, uh, now standing in or replacing Councillor Scott. Uh, declarations of interest. Uh, members, any declarations to advise us? Oh, thank you. I'll return to my announcements. I've received briefings from um, Andrew Gosler and Ginny Knight. So the tourism strategy I'd like to update you on. Um, as it was in the work programme outlined at the last Business and Housing Policy Committee, development um, of the evidence base encompassing data and intelligence is progressing as planned. This information will inform the stakeholder engagement activities scheduled over the spring and summer period, when the strategy will be developed in collaboration with operators in the visitor economy across the district. Discussions are taking place with the University of Winchester in respect of their master and PhD students supporting development of the strategy and monitoring its delivery. Update on the uh, UK Shared Prosperity Fund is that the Council eventually received its grant determination confirmation of its 1 million uh, UK Shared Prosperity Fund allocation on the 6th of December last year. Projects planned for the first year of the uh, programme ending next month on the 31st of March have been commenced, including delivery of the recent Enchanted Light Garden, which was well received as illustrated in social media. Hopefully we'll identify it this evening on your way in. Projects delivered by both officers and external partners for 2023-24 are being finalised. And finally, please note that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund allocation to the Council provides the majority of funding for projects which will take place in 2024-25. And then finally, the Council still awaits the decision on its £749,000 allocation from the Rural England Prosperity Fund, against which projects and spend are due to commence on the 1st of April 2023 and run through until Mar 31st of March. 2025. The update on some of the housing papers that we've looked at is that at the last Business and Housing Policy Committee meeting, Mrs Thorburn outlined the scoping of the housing strategy preparation work. Officers listened to the community, uh, committee member feedback um, that the housing strategy as an important document should not be rushed. To ensure that it continues to deliver on the council plan priorities and aligns with the local plan. Since that report, further work has taken place to help shape the refreshed housing strategy, which includes a housing market context report for the Winchester district, providing an updated evidence base to support development of the housing strategy, a stakeholder feedback document, resident survey feedback from 406 respondents and the potential priorities emerging document. 
So officers are currently preparing their draft housing strategy, which will they will then bring back to this committee for review and discussion and hold an all members briefing before taking the paper to the housing cabinet committee for final approval. Timelines are uh, to be yet to be agreed with both chairs. An update on the disabled facilities grant is that the paper took into account our feedback at the last meeting and the revised report will go to the housing cabinet committee on the 21st of March as part of the private sector housing strategy paper. Finally, officers have been asked to comment on the impact on officer time and existing projects if a task and finish group was to be established early in the next municipal year to review the impact of HMOs, houses in multiple occupation, um, and also to uh, assess and report upon the consequences of a policy change to support the installation of showers instead of baths. The uh, feedback was not possible for today, but we can list these items of work on the work plan as matters for consideration um, in the work plan for next year. Now able to move to item four uh, to approve minutes of the previous meeting held on the 29th of November 2022. Can these be agreed, please? Agreed? Thank you. Item five, public uh, participation. Um, welcome to um, members of TACT and Ian Tate. Um, I understand you're um, all um, happy to wait until item seven on the agenda um, as we progress uh, first to the Winchester District Cultural Strategy Scoping Document. Is that correct? Are you happy with that? Yes, thank you very much. Right then, we're now able to move on to item six of the agenda, which is the Winchester District Cultural Strategy Scoping Document. I'll ask Councillor Thompson to introduce the report for us. Um, thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to be presenting this paper tonight. The need for developing a new cultural strategy was one of the actions identified within the Green Economic Development Strategy, um, which came to this committee last year when we agreed um, its two year action plan. Of course, culture means very different things to different people and understanding that difference across the wide range of communities and groups within our district is really important. We are so lucky to live in a district which has an abundance of natural environmental assets, as well as a unique cultural and historic heritage. And we already have a great cultural offer. It is this that makes living here so special and what drives our visitor economy. So it's really important that going forward, we understand what we have within our district and where the gaps are and that we build on and develop our cultural offering in a way that is inclusive for all and recognises the value that culture brings to all our lives. Of course, we cannot do this on our own, which is why we've set up a stakeholder group to engage with and almost co-write our strategy. And I'm very grateful tonight for Simon from Arts Council England for coming along um, to this meeting and, um, and, and taking part. This is important because this won't be a strategy just designed for the City Council to implement, but we want it to become a strategy for all those groups and we'll be expecting our, our wider community to certainly buy into it. So um, I could say a lot more, but I'm going to stop there. What we are asking the committee to do tonight is obviously a comment on the scoping paper that we've got be before you. Um, also, obviously, look at the presentation which we're about to give, um, uh, fronted up by Andrew Gostolo and Emmeline Hickman. Um, and, and so give us good feedback so we can make sure that we are on the right track and, uh, and we can get on with actually producing uh, the, the final strategy. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Thompson. Um, so as, as Councillor Thompson says, we have um, Simon Jutton um, on MS Teams today um, as represented from the Arts Council England. Um, and we have made um, an agreement with Arts Council England that they will be partnering um, with us uh, through the development um, of this strategy, um, which is a, a great benefit um, to us in terms of actually um, creating some of the priorities um, and principles around the strategy. Um, so Simon's going to spend um, a few minutes um, just giving us some national context about Arts Council England um, and then we'll hand over to Emmeline Hickman um, who joined us um, in September last year um, as our lead uh, for um, culture and the creative sector um, and then between herself and, and myself we'll give you some evidence uh, base uh, information uh, which is obviously key uh, to developing um, the strategy going forward um, as Councillor Thompson said collaboratively with operators um, across the cultural sector. Um, so, Simon, um, over to you for a few minutes of, of national context, if you please. OK, uh, can you hear me OK? Is that all right? Great. Um, hello. I'm sorry I can't be uh, there tonight. I've got other commitments uh, over here in Bristol. Um, so uh, I'm Simon Jutton. I work for uh, Arts Council England. Uh, for those that don't know, we are the National Development Agency uh, for Culture. Uh, which covers uh, all of the uh, different art forms, um, a lot of aspects of uh, heritage, particularly museums uh, and library development as well. Um, we're really pleased to be able to uh, work with you on uh, on this strategy, on developing this strategy, and I hope it is an opportunity uh, that you take up. My particular role is um, as the lead for Hampshire, uh, and I am pleased to say that I think almost every district now uh, in Hampshire uh, has a cultural strategy uh, or is uh, about to publish one. Uh, and indeed, I know the county are also um, uh, looking at uh, developing a cultural strategy as well. Um, our, our strategy, the Arts Council strategy, we have a 10 year strategy, which is called Let's Create. And essentially it has three outcomes. Um, the first of those outcomes uh, is uh, called creative people. So basically this is that we want to uh, see, make sure that everybody in the country, whoever they are, has the opportunity to be creative or take part in creative activity. So that might be um, it might be it might be reading, it might be singing in a choir, it could be going to the theatre, going to an art exhibition, it could be, be being an artist. But we want everyone to have that opportunity to um, uh, fulfill their lives really um, through culture and creative activity. In order to do that, we need to achieve the second of our outcomes, which is cultural communities. Um, cultural communities really refers to the fact that obviously if people are to take part in activity and it's and it's good quality activity, you need the the theatres, the galleries, the museums, you need the um, arts groups, the choirs, the libraries, etc. So you need that infrastructure so that people have got those opportunities. And that is something which doesn't happen uh, because because we want it to happen invariably anywhere where we're working. This happens where we work closely with partners to make sure that those opportunities are there. And, and probably the most important partner is the local authority uh, in most cases. So this is why we're really pleased that you are looking at developing a strategy. And, and the third outcome is that we hope that if we achieve this, uh, we will uh, achieve our vision of a creative and cultural country that is flourishing, uh, that is is giving people happy, fulfilled lives, but also helping to create jobs uh, and to help um, sell our, our really important creative industries around the world. Um, I think it's really important to say that in developing a cultural strategy, our advice always is not to create it uh, in isolation. Uh, a cultural strategy should be about, first and foremost, should really be about what are the priorities for a particular place. So in a particular place, uh, a lot of people will say well, we're, we are trying to uh, establish more um, healthier communities, more social cohesion, uh, better, better employment opportunities, uh, better education. And that a cultural strategy isn't instead of these things, but rather it's 
how the cultural how culture and creative activity can play its part in achieving those things. So it's really important that it is a, a place based strategy. Um, increasingly, certainly we see across uh, Hampshire, but across the country at the moment, uh, cultural strategies are really helping to shape particularly plans around regeneration, looking at um, high streets uh, and town centres. So just recently, you may be aware uh, in, in Rushmore, um, the the work that had been done around a cultural strategy, I, I think, helped to lever in um, some levelling up funding, uh, which in, in large part is about developing a new cultural centre in the centre of Farnborough. It's just an example, but uh, having a cultural strategy provides a framework for yourselves and, and actually for us as well to know that anything that we're supporting or doing is supporting the priorities of that place. So um, that's the sort of um, grand plan um, in several places. Once a strategy is in place, uh, a cultural compact is formed. And this is generally where you've got different partners, including the local authority and ourselves, uh, but normally the uh, higher education uh, sector, industry, etc., that oversee that strategy. And that's something which we can advise on. We, um, because of the nature of our work and our resources, um, we can't work equally across the country. So uh, our funding schemes are open to everywhere in the country, but our particular focus is on uh, those places which have low levels of cultural engagement at the moment. I'm happy to say, I suppose, uh, that Winchester uh, District isn't one of those. Uh, we've got relatively high levels of cultural engagement, but we do see Winchester uh, as a district as a place of opportunity and it's for the reasons that uh, the, the councillor uh, mentioned uh, in her introduction uh, you have such uh, a rich heritage such a strong current cultural scene uh, this is more about how do you make that opportunity work and how do you ensure that that is uh, accessible to everybody is really benefiting all of the people that live visit and and, and work in the district um, so we've been uh, advising, providing a bit of support uh, as best we can, um, and we will continue to do that, continue to um, come along to the sessions that, that Andrew and Emmeline are uh, organising. Um, and in time uh, can talk about if there is the formation of a cultural compact, providing uh, maybe a bit of um, financial support towards that. Um, does that cover everything <laughs> is that what you were looking for yes yeah, thanks uh, thanks very much uh, simon um so i'd like to hand over now to emmeline um to start um the journey and the story through the evidence base you too, my mind. um simon you will be able to um to still stay on the call with us will you to um for until after the other presentations uh, to be able to participate in questions will you uh, yes, I've, I've got, well, I've gotten to about seven o'clock, if that's okay. okay. Uh, and no, but that's if there's any questions, let, let me know. Thank you, that would be great. And then just before we proceed, uh, Councillor Isaacs, welcome. Um, can I just check that you have no declarations of interest you wish to make? Apologies for arriving slightly late for work. Um, no, no declarations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, Emily. No worries, thank you very much. Um, so I believe we have a presentation um, and the first slide is talking about um, Winchester's population and I'm sure many of you are probably far more familiar with this than others but um, you've got the spread of ages across the district on this slide here um, and one thing that is particularly interesting is between um, the 2011 and 2021 census, we had an increase of 12,260 retirees, but there was only an increase of 4,801 uh, over 65s. So that little piece of information does suggest that people are retiring before 65. So that could be an audience that we might be able to target within our work because they are not at work but they might have lots of time to spend doing lots of nice creative activity. Um, next slide please. Um, also um, on changes in the population between 2011 and 2021, um, 
it's quite easy, I would say, to perhaps overlook 0.7% of the population, um, but actually it's quite um, a fast increase changing population. Um, for example, that one there on, under religion, 0.7% uh, identify as Hindu in Winchester, but actually that's doubled in the last 10 years. So those populations are changing quite rapidly. Um, and traditionally, some of these groups might gravitate towards one another. So another piece of research for us to do is, are there clusters that we can then um, take some of this work to work with in these particular communities? Uh, next slide, please. Um, a little note on deprivation um, uh, on, on the national scale. It's always indices of multiple deprivation, um, which Winchester doesn't feature in, but actually there are that doesn't mean that Winchester doesn't have its challenges. Um, so they, you can see from the dark blue on the presentation there, that actually on some of the markers, quite significant proportions of Winchester do feature in those 10% most deprived for um, affordability and accessible to housing and um, about um, access to the grid and the internet and things like that. So there are barriers that we might need to address within our strategy. Next slide, please. Um, and then we've also got four wards that um, fall into the top 10% most deprived for access to leisure facilities. Um, so whilst 73% of adults are physically active, 48% um, of young people are physically active. So that's almost half of our young people are inactive. Um, would you just um, hold fire for a second? Councillor Horrock? Uh, sorry, Chair, I'm really struggling to hear. Um, this is my deaf side, and I don't know whether we could ask the officer to speak a little closer to the new microphones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Apologies. Um, yes, so 48% um, people of young people are physically inactive, so um, access to those leisure facilities is potentially an issue for that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, the Active Live survey, which is an Arts Council England survey. Um, what percentage of people have surveyed said they have done these activities in the last 12 months? Um, interesting what happens in 2020 and we all know why. Um, but what is interesting is actually the spent time doing creative, artistic, theatrical or music activity or craft is much less affected than the others. And I think it's important to note there that most of those activities can be done from home. Um, and so that is a, a big area for um, focus for us. And then the next slide um, just does us a little comparison on those responses in comparison to the national Hampshire and New Forest averages. And you can see across the board, Winchester performs better than all of them, even in the pandemic state. So. Um, I think that tells us a lot about the type of people living here and what they might like to engage in. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit more on Winchester district audiences. The names down the left hand side might not mean very much if you're not familiar with audience agency, but it's very similar to systems such as Acorn or Mosaic, where it splits the, the um, population by postcode and things like that. Um, but what is really interesting, as Simon alluded to, um, 80% of Winchester audiences are either high or medium engaged, so they are willing and ready to participate. We just need to make sure we're offering the right things to them. Next slide, please. So there's a little bit of a map there which maps some of those um, segments that I alluded to a second ago. Um, and the biggest section there is the green section. Um, affluent, professional, suburbanite, keen consumers of traditional culture. Um, so that's probably not a surprise to most people. Um, there are two little yellow dots right in the centre of the city, um, highly active, diverse, social and ambitious, regular engagers, um, conveniently located around our two universities, which is um, that that segment is quite highly student based. So. Um, very interesting in terms of what people will engage in. This data doesn't tell us where they engage in culture. It is limited on that front, but tells us they are willing to engage, which is good to know. Next slide, please. Um, OK, so a little bit of information on audience trends in general. Um, 
audience appetites have changed throughout the pandemic. Um, people probably wouldn't have engaged in di digital content before, but because they started to, because they had no choice, they now still want it. So um, online engagement is now really key and people are being asked to provide both hybrid events where they have both in-person and digital offers. Um, and part, part of the change also in some of the surveys done by Arts Council England is around um, broadening the um, scope of creativity. So they've started including things like gardening, cooking, fashion within that creativity. And uh, that means that more people are now ident identifying as creative within themselves, which is really useful as well. Next slide, please. That slide's not very clear, I apologise, but um, it's um, showing that the left hand column is the highest all the way across the board, regardless of which creative activity there is. Um, and that is the young people. So the 16 to 24 year olds. So um, they're a really key target demographic for us um, and they are engaging in cultural activity, even if it's just curating their content on TikTok, they are doing the engagement. And also the only thing they don't rank highest on is reading, but 75% of them said they read. So that's also not insignificant. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, so obviously Winchester, um, one great win was done in 2020 and there was a culture subgroup. Um, a lot of the sentiment from that is that, you know, the, the members of the district are ready and willing to co collaborate, um, but they need a strong leadership and an action orientated plan. Um, so that's a really big thing for us to take through to our strategy to make sure that that's included. And then on the next slide, um, we've just got some of the things that were discussed within that cultural group. Don't want to go into too much detail, but um, just kind of demonstrates the breadth of that discussion that was had just a few years ago. And then um, there are four suggested big, big picture projects that came out of that one great win. And in some guise or another, all four of them are ready, active, being worked on by the teams here. So um, that's very much feeding into what we are doing. Uh, next slide, please. So then we did a little bit of mapping around cultural and creative organisations in Winchester um, using SIC codes on our database. Um, one of them is arts, recreation and entertainment. So these are all the ones that you might traditionally think of as a um, creative or cultural business, um, of which there are 781 in the district. And then on the next slide, we've got um, an additional 589, which sit under information and communication, which are also creative around motion picture, video, book publishing, all those sorts of things. And then on the next slide again, we've got um, an additional 617 that sit under the title of professional, scientific and technical activities. Um, which includes architecture, which we know is quite significant in Winchester, which then on the next slide gives us the overall picture of the number of cultural and creative organisations in Winchester. So there are just over 11,000 active companies on Companies House. Just under 2,000 of those are registered in those SIC codes that we've just listed, which gives us a 16% creative business in Winchester, which is significant. And then we've also got two rather large segments on that diagram there, which is advertising and design, and then film, television and video. So again, that just goes to show how strong the offer already is within Winchester. And then on the next slide, I just summarise my points around um, other factors that may or may not affect cultural and creative activity and offer. Um, we're not strangers to the cost of living crisis and the huge inflation rates that we're currently facing, um, meaning people are having to make dis difficult decisions and 92% of population have indicated that they expect to decrease their spend on entertainment and leisure. And then um, more specifically towards our businesses, energy crisis is causing venue costs to go up exponentially whilst still recovering from the pandemic and then also having to negotiate issues around Brexit and making it more complicated and expensive to work with artists outside of the UK. 
I'm just going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to do a little bit more on what we got to so far. Thank you, Emmeline. Um, just uh, two or three more um, slides to go. Um, so um, this slide you'll be familiar with um, at a previous Business Housing Policy Committee uh, meeting. We brought um, the research that we've done into the Winchester District Festivals to the committee. Um, and um, this is uh, very much um, part of our evidence base uh, for the development of the culture strategy. And we recognise uh, the importance and the role um, of our festivals um, and events programme uh, that we already um, have within the city and across the district and recognizing that in the last in the last 12 years um, we've moved uh, from um, six to over 36 um, festivals and events um, but what the research did show and just to sort of uh, clarify and indeed we've we've hit, heard this several times throughout the evidence base that we've been um, undertaking um, is that the funding and financial stability um, is very much a challenge uh, for festivals and events as is as is the operational delivery uh, which is very heav heavily reliant on volunteers um, and also we know that um, the current program um, attracts 12% of staying visitors. So the vast majority of visitors are residents and day visitors. And whilst that is really important from an economic perspective, and that's not the only perspective that we look at in terms of culture, but from an economic perspective, we know from our research um, that staying visitors uh, generate um, more um, uh, local spend um, than, than day visitors. So that's perhaps something uh, potentially to look at um, going forward as well and of course there are opportunities to broaden the benefits of the events um, and the festivals um, across the district in terms of um, business engagement um, within those next slide please and then as we also said earlier um, we've been undertaking um, a significant review of um, other culture strategies um, across the country um, we've looked at a total of 26 um, this is a combination of strategies that have been recommended to us by Arts Council England um, and also strategies that um, are from destinations comparis comparative to uh, Winchester District, um, but also those that um, are best practice as well, um, that show some innovation and some, some learning that we may uh, wish to undertake. Um, and there's very much some sort of key messages in that bar chart there uh, showing some common themes um, across those 26 strategies um, around partnership and skills, um, financial stability that I've just touched on, um, diversity um, and industry growth um, have been quite key. Interestingly, well-being is down the lower end of that. Um, now that could be very much of the snapshot of strategies that we have taken. Um, when we look at um, Arts Council England's Let's Create Wellbeing um, and Health, etc., um, are two sort of very key strands um, of their strategy and potentially something that we would look um, to replicate um, here in Winchester. Um, we're also working with um, Dr Daniel Ashton from Winchester School of Art, um, who's a nationally recognised authority on cultural sector policy um, and principal investigators on the local government data analytics for culture and creativity. And we'll be working in partnership with them um, and uh, the University of Winchester um, throughout this process and looking at strategies uh, further in terms of the evidence, evidence base. Next slide, please. Um, and then, as we've also alluded uh, to, this strategy um, in order to be achieved has to be delivered collaboratively, not only with external partners, um, but with internal partners as well. Um, and so alignment with various key strategies across the authority is absolutely key. Um, the local plan being one of those. Um, and this uh, slide just illustrates some of the collaborative work that we've been doing um, with our um, colleagues in strategic planning um, to ensure that um, uh, the creative and the cultural sectors are recognised um, within uh, the local plan um, and indeed um, how the local plan can actually influence um, an emerging cultural strategy as well um, and there's some examples there um, of some of the areas that we've looked at and also most importantly and as um, Councillor Thompson first indicated our his historic environment um, is very much uh, recognised and if we go to the next slide just to put that into context in terms of the local plan um, it gives you an idea um, of the amount um, of historic environment that we have um, around us um, that we want, must make sure that this uh, cultural strategy um, protects at all costs um, and the next slide please 
And then finally, just a little bit um, on consultation. We've mentioned several times that this strategy will be delivered um, collaboratively. We've already started that process um, and um, we um, are carrying out a series of internal and external stakeholder group um, works and we've um, established those and as illustrated on page 17 and 18 um, of uh, your papers that you've received today. Next slide, please. Um, and we've started that um, with um, stakeholder engagement with um, organisations and, and group meetings um, through our cultural sector network. Um, and we've also established a cultural sector um, stakeholder group um, that also met um, on the 1st of February. Um, and they've looked at a number of different exercises, um, love it, hate it, want it being one of them, um, and SWAT, something you'll be very familiar with, strengths, weakness, opportunities and threats um, as well. Um, and this group will continue um, to work with us um, throughout the development of the strategy. Next slide, please. Um, and then um, this slide just gives you some of the ideas of the sort of themes that were uh, were coming out um, of the first meeting um, that were held. Um, Exeter was um, commented quite uh, a lot in terms of its approach um, to cultural strategy. Um, very much culture as a tool for placemaking was highlighted. Indeed, we've heard Simon talk about that earlier as well. And then finally, just to close off, uh, just a li little bit about um, the next steps. Um, so the paper um, that you've received um, outlines four key stages um, that we will go through um, in terms of the development of the strategy. Um, and we plan to complete the evidence based work between now and Easter. And then through the summer period, we will continue to work with a stakeholder group um, clarifying and, and, and highlighting the principles and aims of the strategy shaping the strategic direction and priorities, um, continue the work with alignments of um, Winchester City Council strategies, and then continue to test this with a wider consultation group um, through surveys, etc., cetera, um, with residents um, as well as operators uh, within the cultural creative sectors, um, moving towards um, a set of priorities and actions uh, with a plan um, to adopt the strategy um, in the late summer early autumn of uh, of this year. So that ends um, a, sort of a, a fairly fast summary of the evidence that we've we've carried out. Um, and I don't know whether Councillor Thompson wants to have any closing words. Um, thank you very much, uh, Andrew and Emmeline, for um, that whistle stop tour through the evidence base that, that we'll be looking at. Um, I think that was really helpful. Um, and obviously uh, members of the committee have got that slide pack within the papers. So they're there to, um, you, you know, you can go back and look at them um, in greater detail. Um, but um, apart from thanking you for, for your work on this, I think we'll now open it up to questions. Uh, can I just check, um, Simon, we exceeded your uh, seven o'clock um, ideal deadline. Have you got a few more minutes for us at all? Uh, a, a couple more. I've got to be somewhere by 7.30. So uh, okay. yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions there briefly. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll ask anybody um, firstly uh, to um, identify questions that uh, should be directed to you. Uh, is there anybody who specifically has a question uh, for Simon Jutton at all, please? Maybe whilst you're thinking about it, David, our papers make reference from time to time to the inclusion of or reference to sport. And, and I was wondering what your thoughts are in terms of um, the scope of the strategy encompassing um, sport in all of its guises, because the, the SIC codes referred to betting, um, gambling, fitness. Um, is that something that you would expect to uh, at least be um, part of the strategy if only a, 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 a minor element or how, how does the Arts Council address sport when it, in, in a cultural strategy paper? Um, we uh, we don't cover sport ourselves, obviously it's a separate um, sports council, but quite often we find that there is crossover and some cultural strategies do include it. There's no right or wrong to that. Um, Certainly, um, we work quite a lot in Hampshire with Energize Me. Some people might be aware of as an active um, lives organisation. And we often find that we are wanting to work in similar places, but also that barriers to 
cultural participation, uh, sometimes are the same as barriers to sporting active life um, participation. So uh, not against it being involved at all. It isn't something we would directly fund because uh, the way we're set up, um, but I can see the benefits of including it if it makes sense for you as, as a place. Thank you for that. But has anybody else uh, a question that they are desperate to ask um, Simon or shall we let him prepare for his next meeting? Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Isaacs. Thank you. Um, just a quick question in relation to my particular ward. Access to housing is quite good, um, but where it comes to leisure. Can you take the mic just slightly closer to you? Yes, I can. Can you hear me now? Um, access to housing is reasonably good in our area, but when it comes to access to sports facilities, it's in the very low sections. There's nothing that I can see on a quick glance, sort of, you know, that I can find to rectify that. Would that be something that you're looking towards within the plans for those areas that perhaps due to access or where they are geographically outside of Winchester, that you will increase the access to um, those kinds of facilities within the plan? Maybe we can come back to that one in a minute because um, unless Simon would like to correct me, I'm not, I don't, I think he distanced himself from, from sport. Um, and said that our, its inclusion and, and thoughts were were for us. I, did, did I misunderstand? Did you want that question to be well, answered yeah. by Simon? Well, sport is sport, but yes. leisure facilities are leisure facilities and not to okay. be confused between the two, I think, unless I'm wrong. No, sorry. Oh. I was trying to make sure that you were happy and, and well placed to answer. Can you um, uh, answer Councillor Isaac's question, please, about um, um, embracing leisure facilities as opposed to considering sport. Is that something that you and the Arts, Arts Council would um, consider part or be able to comment on or should we look to the Sports Council? Uh, it's, it's a bit of both really. Um, a, a lot of um, cultural provision across the country, as I'm sure you know too well, uh, is, is in leisure facilities, it's in village halls, uh, it's in outdoor spaces. So we don't draw a line around something just because of, of what it's called. We may well fund what goes into that. Um, we're probably less likely to, f to revenue fund, for example, a leisure facility that does uh, a wider range of things but we might fund some of the activities but certainly if you're looking at sport I would recommend talking to Sport England, talking to Energize Me, uh, getting that sense but the I, I referenced earlier on the development that's happening in um, Farnborough and that that in itself is a, a very large but um, uh, leisure civic and cultural complex or building um, so Yes, we're interested, not not against it, but we wouldn't necessarily be um, funding everything that happened in it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Great, and I will have to dash. I'm, I'm afraid. No, well, thank you very much for extending the time available to us. It's great. No, to thank you. you for asking me. It's been good really night. good. Thank you. Okay, um, we can now open up the questions to. Um, Yes, Councillor Isaacs. Thank you, Chair. It's only a quick question. In relation to the Winchester Cultural and Creative Organisations, uh, which I think is on slide 42, 43 of page 94, um, there's a lot of reference to Winchester. Is that Winchester as is or Winchester District? Could you just clarify the two, please? That is Winchester District. Could we amend that to reflect that? Would that be OK? Yeah, no thanks. Problem. Councillor Brooke. Thank you, Chair. Um, we In the report, it says we're building on what is already well established. Well, if we're talking about cultural and our historical heritage, I think that that's only well established really in Winchester city centre. Um, and I think particularly as it's made reference in here to people spending less on culture and leisure um, due to the cost of living, etc. Um, I think it gives us a key opportunity to focus on some of the free things. So, for example, 
history within our district is rife. I mean, it's everywhere. And Southwark do their big D-Day event every year, and I'm not sure if that's included as festivals or if you even know about it. The same as the Overlord show that they have in Denmead every year, where they bring all the tanks in or all of the historic stuff. But simple things like around Denmead, all of the tanks were parked there before they went off to D-Day. The, um, the troops camped out in the woods there before they went off to D-Day. And there are no markers anywhere to tell of the history, no storyboards, things like that, that could be a real simple, get people out walking, exploring the history and knowing what happened in these places. Because I think another generation time, a lot of that history will be lost and gone forever. Is that something we're thinking about? Um, if I could just come in here, um, as Councillor Brook will probably remember, um, I and Alison Woods came down to see Denmead Parish Council um, last summer and we talked about how we might um, help you um, in Denmead actually have a sort of trail with posters and um, um, a, a sort of walking trail that actually informs um, residents and visitors about what happened um, at, in Denmead and around. And um, certainly I've also been to see Allsford and we had a meeting um, uh, where, uh, with um, the Town Trust and we looked at the museum there and there are all sorts of um, there are all sorts of areas that certainly we could do more um, on. Um, there's the Wickham Horse Fair, for instance, which may not appeal to everybody in, in uh, you know, but it is, it is part of culture. And um, I think all these things do need to be embedded in our, in our cultural strategy in some way. But certainly if um, um, parish councils like Denmead have a particular um, area that is rich in history and, and goodness around our district we have an enormous number of um, parishes and, and towns that uh, that have that sort of heritage then yes I, 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 I agree we should be marking that in some way and you know doing something that will actually um, inform visitors so that they can go and visit. Um, I mean, my husband, for instance, went over on, you know, with a number of his friends to France and did the world um, First World War trenches. And I know he'd love to do something the same. <laughs> and I keep coming across various areas that had, um, you know, a, a really poignant part, played a really poignant part in um, the Second World War. And um, I, I think that would be really, really fantastic to be able to promote that sort of thing within our district. Through you, Chair, if I may, I think it's only me banging that drum at the moment. So I just need to drum up some support, which is why I suggested it when you came down to visit. And of course, the parish in Southwark is so involved that they do their D-Day event. But of course, I don't know what's behind these graphs. I don't know if you've noted that there's a museum at Southwark Park, for example. Um, and I don't know how much promotion a military camp would want. So it's, are we allowed to see the details that are behind some of these graphs, some of the things you've got in there to see if there's anything that has been missed? Yeah, we're certainly very happy to, to share the content. Um, I would certainly say that um, this is um, a, 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 this, the approach to the strategy will be very much agile, um, and so this is is not exhaustive, um, and that is the, very much the purpose of the collaboration and the stakeholder groups. Um, and there will be opportunities for parishes to um, uh, be consulted on and be informed, uh, be, be able to inform the development strategy to make sure that it is it is in the round and everything that is is collected. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in terms of things that are lacking, well, first of all, can I just say thank you for the presentation and really rich, data rich uh, presentation, which is very, very interesting. 
Uh, welcome the approach taken. Welcome the chance you're giving us to have uh, a look at this at this early scoping stage. Uh, I was I was going to make one question really, which is really about the facilities that the uh, city council uh, can provide and cities uh, facilities that are identified as lacking uh, in supporting culture and the creative industries. One that comes up again and again and came up in in the survey that you did is the lack of low cost uh, space for workshops and cultural uh, activities, as well as small creative businesses that are contributing in the cultural sphere. And the other, the second is the lack of exhibition space. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that these findings are feeding through into other work streams that the council is working on. So, for example, with the small spaces for creative industries, we have an opportunity to address that in the context of the central Winchester regeneration work. And indeed, some money has already been spent trying to create uh, a creative hub with low cost units at King's Walk. So it'd be good to see what lessons we can learn from that. Uh, and then in, in terms of the exhibition space, the negotiations uh, with the University of Southampton, which as I understand are intended also to create uh, a publicly available exhibition space. So just to make sure that the, that's a lot of the rich data and messages that you're unveiling through this work is also feeding through into those other work streams. Uh, absolutely, Councillor Ratcliffe, I can confirm that most definitely that that is the case. Um, in the paper, we outline um, how we're working internally as officers um, through uh, with our colleagues at Central Winchester Regeneration, um, with our colleagues um, in sustainability, with our colleagues in local planning as well, um, to make sure that 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 information exchange is happening all the time throughout um, this sort of key development um, phase during the strategy and to ensure that we don't miss those opportunities. Um, and indeed, when, in the conversations that we had with, uh, with um, our strategic planning, with our strategic planning colleagues that um, uh, one of the things that were coming out of repurposing um, of the high street, etc. Um, and, and the opportunity for flexible space was very much highlighted um, as part of that. And so we will very much continue with those conversations across the organisation. Uh, Councillor Cremoyson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so <coughs> I've got, excuse me, I'm going to wrap up a couple of questions into one question, but really there are two. Um, so we touched on that Councillor Isaacs raised the question of sport and that sort of type of thing, whether that was part of the scope for the Arts Council. I guess my take on this uh, strategy is it's not attempting to cover sports deeply. Um, that may, I'm assuming that's a, another subject and would fit within another strategy. So. Uh, the, the question in relation to that is, can you just confirm that so that we're not looking at this thinking sports is a big gap? It's, it's a deliberate decision, I guess. And then I think the second question, um, I, I, it, the first way I phrased it in, my, in what I wrote down was, what budget do you have? But I think there's a bigger question, which is, um, have you done an audit of the kind of resources and opportunities to tap into budgets in multiple different places, which could effectively be levers um, for this strategy to grab hold of. And, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, if it was de determined that this was important, spend some money through XYZ budget and another another uh, initiative through a different budget. So, you know, it could be that the cultural strategy doesn't have its own budget directly, but you can influence through your strategy um, spending in, in multiple different areas. So, um, so the question there is, yeah, uh, have you done that audit of, of those potential resources or is that part of the next, next phase? Um, a little bit of both. To be honest, um, will be the, the easiest answer to that. Um, we are certainly aware that to actually achieve anything here, it has to be done collaboratively, both internally and externally. Um, and that's not just in terms of uh, strategies, that's in terms of resource um, and budget as well. Um, so we will continue um, all of those conversations with our colleagues um, across the authority, whether that's um, connection with sort of the, you know, the movement strategy, whether that's connection with central Winchester regeneration, where there are budgets available to actually 
realise some of these things. And also, it, it's how we work with our external partners as well, um, who have their own um, budgets too. And so there are opportunities where uh, we can potentially realise some of the the sort of the, the priorities and the actions um, that will come out of this process that actual individual stakeholder organisations may well lead on um, as well. Councillor Horrell. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Thank you, Chair. And um, can I re reiterate um, my thanks for the presentation? Some very interesting um, information in here. Um, a couple of points, really, Chair. Um, firstly, just to be clear, the one great win information, if I recall, was done for the town. Uh, not for the district, um, and I think we should be clear about that. Although I know the district at the time wanted to extend it, that that wasn't um, the case. So we just need to be clearer um, about our definitions. Um, and also, Chair, um, just picking up on the sports element, in the list of cultural and creative organisations, we do have activities of sports clubs listed in, and in my own home community I see two down and I'm sure one of those must be the lovely cricket club that we have that encourages a huge cross-section of people but um, um, just to be clear about that that divide that we've talked about this evening sport and, le and leisure um, and the other thing I think to pick up on and, and just really how we make sure that we embrace this and, and listening to the external speaker too, um, there are a lot of cultural and um, creative activities that go on um, in a very everyday way in our rural communities. Film nights at the local village hall, um, the growth of pantomimes in the season, wonderful, wonderful shows put on by uh, groups of individuals, amateur um, uh, sort of um, actors who uh, take up that role and yet we don't necessarily embrace that but we should perhaps find a way of reaching out to those who on a voluntary basis do things in those wider communities don't necessarily have to find a big cinema or a big theatre they happen spontaneously and I think that's something to be embraced in this if we somehow um, can articulate that as we go forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, if I can just come back on what uh, Councillor Horrell's just said, I absolutely agree. And of course, within our district, we have an, um, a, a whole plethora of um, different groups and organisations um, and uh, from different cultures that um, celebrate in a very different way to perhaps um, is you know our normal way of celebrating and i think we also need to take account uh, and recognize that too and somehow in the strategy pick up um, those elements as well because for that community it's very important and um, it is something that you know as a district we're, we're a very welcoming district um, we should celebrate that Thank you. Um, we in that last section, I think, strayed more from the question to comment and uh, observations or to not um, criticise it. But it, if there are other contributions that people would like to make on the on the wider sphere, um, expressing their views, their comments on the paper, um, then please do so now. Uh, Councillor Horrell. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Taking up the point about that broader group, um, uh, the Muslim community, for example, um, established in our district is 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 very well uh, settled and embracing their cultures, their uh, festivals is a good example of how we as an authority um, can play, I think, a greater supporting role. Um, so, Chair, my question, therefore, is in the cultural stakeholder group that has already met. Um, who is in that group? Which which people or organisations are represented there? I'm not sure that I'm uh, clear as to who those individuals are. Thank you. 
Um, in terms of the um, stakeholder groups, um, we've, we've at the minute um, covered that sort of around uh, particular groupings, um, but uh, the stakeholder group is not fully formed yet. We have had an initial meeting uh, with um, a, a number of stakeholders, um, but we are wanting to grow and develop that stakeholder group. Um, so, for example, we didn't have, uh, we invited, but we didn't have representation, um, say, from health, for example, um, and equally, um, similarly, as you say, um, some wider, broader uh, group representation uh, needs to be brought onto that group. We've only had one meeting, um, but we will certainly be wor working to make sure that that group is comprehensive um, going forward. Thank you. That's the group. On the group, I note that it says members and officers, and the only member is Councillor Thompson. And I understand we're able to engage in the strategy itself here, but we're not as members being consulted in a for our knowledge about culture as such. This is consultation on the strategy as opposed to consultation on culture. Um, and I just wondered if we're having members who will be involved in those stakeholder groups. I understand you just said it's evolving, but. Um, the stakeholder groups will have involvement from parishes, um, but we haven't got specific at the moment, haven't got specific uh, member uh, representation. Um, I guess one of the purposes of today was to sort of start that, that discussion. Councillor Brook. Um. Thank you, Chair. I just had one more question on the paper. So um, with the focus on um, carbon neutrality and the discussions in other groups about 15 minute communities, I haven't seen anything in here about any sort of aspirations yet that we'd like to achieve that everybody has some sort of culture within a 15 minute walk. And I know that we've gone through and seen what businesses are around the place, but it's also made reference to a lot of those cultures being at home or private in the district. So I just wondered if there's any aspiration there that we're trying to achieve. Thank you. That's a timely intro as well to um, uh, the fact that I took a written question from Councillor Wallace, who wasn't able to be here. Um, which I'd left with uh, uh, Mr. Gosler, and maybe if he can answer both things um, for us at this stage. Very happy, happy to chair. Um, so, Councillor Wallace's question, and I'll pick up Councillor Brooks as well. Um, Section 2.2 of the report states that the cultural strategy further supports the Council's enhanced focus on greener faster. However, the only reference I could find to support this statement is an insubstantial comment in Section 2.4, quote, inspire people to celebrate and protect our green spaces and reduce their, their carbon footprint. As the Council has repeatedly stated, going greener faster must be at the heart of the Council's activities. Therefore, please, can you elaborate? on how the new cultural strategy intends to support the Council's aim of going greener faster. Um, and the response to that question um, is the development of this strategy is being driven collaboratively with stakeholders across the sector and therefore while sustainability is not mandated within the scoping paper, it is fully anticipated the strategy will support green growth within the cultural and creative sectors and will address how those currently operating in the sector address their transition to strengthen their sustainability credentials. The paper recognises the cultural strategy's connectivity and interdependency with the carbon neutrality action plan through the green economic development strategy. The formation of the consultation groups includes internal and state internal and external stakeholders representing sustainability too. In addition to the measures outlined in the City Council's carbon neutrality roadmap, there are many, many sector specific examples of how sustainable practices are adopted across the sector. An example of this is Julia's bicycle. These approaches to sustainability within the cultural and creative sectors will be addressed as part of the work which will take place as outlined in Workstream 2 when the principles of the strategy and its direction will be established in partnership with stakeholders. And so with particular reference to Councillor Brooks' question around things like, for example, access, accessibility of culture within, say, a 15-minute 
uh, circumference, that sort of thing that, that we would expect uh, the strategy to be addressing. Right, I think it's time now to wrap up um, this item and move forward. Um, I think, it, I mean, it, it's my biggest concern is the, the scope that you, you face and, and the resource that you've got um, to help deliver. And obviously, therefore, there's going to be an enormous need for collaboration and leverage, as, as, as has been mentioned. Um, I, I, you know, I welcome um, reference to um, the sort of markers and uh, information boards. I, you know, on any walk or uh, visit to different places, find them extremely helpful to um, just make the visit and the walk you know, more interesting. And therefore, I welcome them not only in the southern parishes, but, but throughout the district. And um, it is certainly um, advocate um, collaboration with parish councils when you come or if you come to look at where these um, you know, sort of things could be you know, better, you know, more, you know, introduced more widely, because there's a, a great wealth of information there. Um, and thank you for the assurance that you are um, liaising as well as you can to provide you know, the space for the provision of all these activities, be they um, you know, the, for the purposes of uh, knitting or leisure or sport or um, what, whatever. I mean, it's clearly going to be a, a very great demand for, for you know, sort of um, provision uh, for, for spaces to come together for many of these activities rather than them just being private personal ones during, during COVID. So I wish you the very best of luck with the implementation of taking this forward. And I know you're very keen to be as collaborative as possible, but you know, um, you know I, I suppose my, as I say, my, my, my primary thought is the, the need to, to cut the cloth sufficiently to, to take everything forward in, in some way or another, but without um, following any one particular line uh, to the exclusion of others and, and therefore maybe have as a reference the, um, the boxes on page 36, which provide residents feedback about being great to talk about these things, but let's see some of the the, you know, the, the delivery or um, encourage people to feel that they are included, be they the small number of Hindus um, you know, or the, you know, the wider uh, elements of the population. But that was just some of my thoughts from coming from our discussion. So I'd like to move on and Thank you, um, members of TACT and uh, Mr. Tate, for your um, perseverance. And um, I, I hope you found the uh, previous discussion interesting. Uh, so now I'd like to call upon Councillor Ferguson to provide us the introduction um, to this page. And thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Councillor Thompson, um, for um, sitting in and assisting. This stage, may I suggest, Councillor Ferguson, you introduce, and then um, uh, before we have, maybe before we have the presentation, um, I give uh, Mr. Tate and Tate the opportunity to make any general comments. As uh, that suit, suit you all? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. And thank you very much for giving the opportunity to introduce the draft tenant engagement and communication plan to you tonight. I'm delighted that we have um, Gillian Knight and Jeanette Palmer with us, as well as officers who are intimate with this, this policy, particularly um, Mrs Palmer. Um, tenant engagement is fundamental to the Council's housing survey. And we have a really stra strong track record of tenant engagement at Winchester City Council of something we're rightfully proud. We very much value the involvement of our tenants 
in helping us to develop and to shape our plans in terms of our delivery of all of our housing services, whether that's our new build programme, all our services in relation to our current housing stock. We not only have tagged tenant and council together, but we also have a range of other engagement methods and activities for a range of tenants. We know that our tenants value their involvement and we are very thankful as council to all tenants who engage or are part of our engagement activity, whether that's online in response to a survey more directly through focus groups, special interest groups, and particularly TACT. And our special thanks goes to our Chair, Vice Chair and Secretary of TACT who are here tonight, Mr Chair, Mr Light and Mrs Mellish, for all the time and commitment they have given to TACT and to their involvement with the City Council. As I said, we've, I've already said we do have a strong track record in this area, but there are actually four reasons why it's appropriate that we're looking to create a new tenant engagement and communication plan at this stage. Firstly, we know that during the two years plus of the COVID pandemic, we weren't able to engage with our tenants in the way that we would like to. And much engagement was online, for many tenants that felt remote. We're very glad that we're now being able to en enter into full engagement with tenants again, but we feel there are opportunities to improve. The second reason is the Social Housing White Paper published in 2020 in response to the Grenfell um, fire disaster, tower disaster, seeks to improve the way in which landlords engage with tenants, into ensuring that tenants voice tenants can have their voice heard and acted upon. The third reason is we have seen a slight drop off in more active engagement amongst some of our tenant groups. We're aware that we are not engaging as well as we would like to with younger tenants and this needs to be addressed. The fourth reason is we're keen to learn from best practice and to adapt our engagement activities to reflect the way in which tenants want to engage with us. As the paper makes clear, the draft plan before you tonight has very much been created in collaboration and consultation with our tenants through a range of activities. It is a draft plan and we're very keen to hear the committee's comments and thoughts on it this evening. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Mr. Tate, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to address this committee. Whilst I welcome them, paper, I do question why it has come here rather than to cabinet housing. I had expected all relevant housing matters to go directly to that committee, yet this paper isn't even on the agenda for the 21st of March cabinet housing committee. Getting tenant engagement right is essential and one of the lessons learned from Grenfell tragedy is that the housing management need to take very seriously what tenants are saying and that starts by having an effective tenant engagement and communication policy. It, that, that was seen with the, uh, the RWAB ISHAC housing who clearly weren't listening to their tenants about repeated concerns over dampness. I'm a big supporter of TACT and they play a vital role in achieving excellent tenant engagement. However, the support report states there are many sections of the council's residents who don't for one reason get involved uh, with TACT or the council. I have repeatedly argued that the council needs to vary the way it communicates and listens to its tenants. Using social media is important, 
But a move away from a very corporate approach, I think, is required. Sadly, there are only 159 people following the council's tenant Facebook page. This seems to imply that a lot more work is required. The likes of Winchester rants on Facebook often bring up council housing problems and generally the posts are very negative, although I don't believe that's a fair reflection of the service, but it's, it's, it demonstrates a way of communicating with residents. When the council last went through its housing options process some 12 or so years ago, and then some people here will remember that process, it went to TPAS who were experts in tenancy engagement. Peter Marsh, who was one of the leads, is still a Winchester resident and has a housing consultancy business still based in Winchester. Interestingly, the tenants, after the preference of staying with the council, the ALMO, the Arms Length Management Organisation, was strongly favoured because it gave them more power and control over their housing. Having carefully read through the report, it's clear that the officer has an excellent understanding of the challenges of ensuring good engagement and the principle of listening better is an important point. I spend quite a lot of time myself engaging with council tenants for a variety of reasons and you get a very different view of what people are thinking from that face to face contact. And I, I do somehow feel that the changes to the area housing offices and that standing back from tenants and that moving away from that close knowledge of a, of a, a number of tenants perhaps has not proved as, 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 as sensible as perhaps it, it seemed on paper. Sorry, sorry, Jim, I'm not cutting this to take off, but just to say that's the three minutes. As... That, I think that's, I think that's, actually my last sentence so uh, I, I, but thank thank you thank you chair uh councillor ferguson would you like to uh, provide a short re response to some of those um thank you chair and um thank you mr tate both through your interest in coming here today and speaking so passionately about the tenant engagement process i think as we go through the draft um report Chairman of the draft plan, you can see that we're aware of many of these issues and this plan is set to try and address some of those issues, particularly that greater face to face engagement. And as I said in my introduction, some of that was lost during the COVID pandemic for obviously legitimate reasons, but there is a need to do more of that. Um, the issue around um, TPAS and that independent review, again in the draft report, and I'm sure Mrs Palmer will come on to this, um, we are seeking to have an independent review of this draft strategy as well, so that we have that outward looking piece. And again, we've engaged with tenants to ask them if that is what they would like and who would they like to do it. And we've had strong feedback from them. So it wasn't a decision we made, that's been done through and with our tenants. Um, the issue of the sort of area managers that is something we are currently seeking to address. And in fact, the neighbourhood services engagement officers, the two posts that were identified, which we've been trying actively to recruit for over the past year. I'm delighted to say that we have finally recruited one appropriate officer of the two. We aren't giving up on the second and they will be starting on the 15th of March. So that's getting back to having a neighbourhood service officer in our estates, which I think will help with that. Um, the point about Facebook, um, again, our Facebook page 159, uh, Winchester rants, because of the nature of what people bring up, um, it's a bit like bad news on a newspaper headline. That often gets a lot of response. I know for officers it's quite discouraging at times because the people who are having a fantastic service, who tell us about the fantastic service they've had or the responsiveness around the repair, they don't go and rant. Nobody rants, well done, it was fantastic. You know, nobody does that. But people, <laughs> it's true, actually, Mr. Tate, you have recently made a made a good, a good, fantastic positive rant about I think toilets was, was the one that you were talking about. Um, but the point is that that often doesn't get that voice. But you are right, if our tenants are engaging in different ways, Facebook for the younger generation is like, you know, in the dark ages 
we might need to be on TikTok for them. Who knows? But it is a, a good point well made. And that listening better point, absolutely. That is core to this drug plan. We want to listen better. We want to hear. We need to give the opportunity to listen. And the key thing in the draft plan, again, which I'm sure will come out, is giving our tenants the opportunity to tell us and to make sure we're listening to them when they want to tell us in all appropriate settings, and making sure we don't lose that. Thank you, Mr Tate. Does anyone from Tactica, you're, you're, you're here, did, did any of you want to make any? Yes, um, I agree with um, what some of the things that Mr Tate said and I would like to um, bring more younger people to tact and to have a conversation with them tenants that are younger and also more people from different ethnic minorities and um, which we are lacking at this time. But um, I would like to see uh, that happen in the near future. And um, also um, that the council can actually provide what is down on this consultation written down, that they can provide all the things that are on there. So. Hopefully we can go forward and um, work together in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so my my take on that is that you have a concern that the draft, um, as expressed, doesn't actually provide for sufficient communication with those um, uh, minority or, or younger groups or uh, you know those that you feel aren't currently included. Um, uh, okay, so, so maybe because it's going to go back to tech and, and I think there is discussion, if you think there is a gap then please do highlight it because I, I don't think that's intended from from what I've looked at, the, you know, the plan looks is, is seeking to be much more inclusive and to pick up exactly those groups you've missed. But I'll I'll ask Councillor Ferguson to respond formally to that. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you um, for your comments, Chair, Chair of Tact, as well. Um, the plan definitely highlights the, those missed missed groups, and it and it talks about how we need to specifically action or activity and target it at the, the the underrepresented groups in in the first place and in fact that came back from a discussion with tact when we presented the draft plan to them we were talking about that face-to-face -face engagement and their comments back to us were you know you don't need to in keep engaging better with the people who are already engaged focus your activities and your resources which i think is what the chair of tact is trying to highlight making sure that do we have the resources to everything? If we don't, focus our resources on those really hard to reach groups where we want that greater voice, that greater representation. I don't know whether Mrs Palmer would like to add anything. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson, and thank you, Chair of Tact. Yeah, it's a really good point, very good point. Do we have the resources? And I think when I go through the report, it, it says that What's quite clear from the messages that we've got from the other sector providers is that this is something that isn't led, if you like, just by one team within the council. It's something that everybody buys into who works in the housing service. And it's understanding that in terms of having a process that people can use to feed back those views on the one hand, and that those who are having those conversations, having those face-to-face -face interactions, feel empowered that they've got a process to understand that, oh no, this is something that's important that has to go back. So making it easier, if you like, for the people, the tenants in the houses on the one side, um, to just have a conversation with somebody they may see on a fairly regular basis, 
but also making it easier for that member of staff to bring that back to service improvement teams, decision makers, uh, that approach. So in terms of the resources, it's taking that on board and saying that it may not just rest with the tenant involvement team, that everybody has their role to play. And that is one of the ways in which hopefully we'll, we'll resource all those things that we've got now. But I think it is a good point. It's being able to release the resources to do that. So it's not underestimating the task. I think that's what Mr. <laughs> Mr. Light quite um, <laughs> respectfully actually brought to the attention. So yes, thank you for that. It's a good point. OK, no, no, thank you. Um, so we can move on to the, maybe the uh, presentation to us, sort of the, um, you know, the, uh, your, your report and um, particularly if you if it strikes you that you um, draw our attention to um, the uh, extra steps being taken to try to uh, reach out to those who don't normally participate so far. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yes, so this uh, is presented to members, as Councillor Ferguson has said, it's part of our partnership approach to building this plan. Um, so we're here today to hear the views of councillors on the content of the plan as it stands at the moment, because um, obviously this is in draft form. Um, this plan has been the product of a couple of years work, and I think you've probably picked that up from the papers. There's been a lot that's gone into um, putting the plan together. There's been a lot of consultation um, activities along the way, uh, and obviously they're quite varied in terms of face-to-face -face and surveys, both digital and, and hard copy as well. And there's been a lot of research with other sector providers, leaders uh, within housing who understand good practice, have experience of what works and what doesn't work, um, especially when it comes to those underrepresented groups, because as has been pointed out, reaching out to those younger households is quite key, but we're not alone in that. So that may be our experience here, but we're not by any means on our own with that. So some people I know have had some successes with that, I believe. Um, so the main thrust really is dealing with that representation um, and also looking at satisfaction levels because we look at the satisfaction in terms of how Tenants feel they are listened to and there is some dissatisfaction there. So we have tried to drill down into that by having face-to-face uh, -face discussions with tenants along the way. Um, the representation is quite an interesting point through the years, but over 20 years now, we have done um, tenant satisfaction surveys. And over those years, the general trends haven't really changed a great deal. And what the results are is that if you, um, the satisfaction varies generally on the basis of the same things. And one of those will be whether you live in the city or whether you live in the rural area. If you do live in the city, which part of the city you live in, because certain areas in the city tend to have lower satisfaction levels than others. And of course, the other big one is age. So if you are younger, you are less likely to be satisfied than older households. So if you know that information and you know that those are where you're, if you want to find out how to improve your service, you need to be talking to those certain households. And then you look at the profile of those who are currently engaged and you can see <laughs> the gap is the younger people. We're quite um, well represented on those spread between city and rural. We're quite well represented in the mix between general needs um, and sheltered. And we're quite well represented, certainly from face to face, um, in terms of those different districts. So there's less satisfied districts are engaging with the council. That's that's you know, we're quite um, we're quite sound on those areas. The gap is the younger people. So that is going to be obviously one of our main features of the plan. So when we put the plan together, you can see in Appendix 1, I'm not going to go through it, there's several pages of the work that we've done in terms of talking to people. So I hope um, the committee feel that we've been quite thorough in our 
you'd attempt to get the views from a cross section of people. Um, and the messages that came out, I'm going to, I will go through that as a result of that. Um, we just point, set out in section 4.3 of the report. So what tenants told us um, from when we've had conversations is, which is quite interesting really, because we, we are looking at the performance measure, if you like, in terms of how satisfied people are with being listened to. And what we understand as officers and maybe elected members may be something completely different to what the households who are answering those surveys see as being listened to. So when we investigated that further and we had those conversations to them, being listened to is those very face to face conversations which Councillor Tate alluded to when talking to the housing officers. It is those people they will talk to when they phone up with their repairs, it's those people who come to the house to deliver the service. If they tell them something about the service, that's the point at which how we deliver and how we act on that makes them feel listened to. So it's improving the way we respond to that part, that part of the customer journey, if you like, that we can then take feedback back, if you like, and then use that. I don't know whether you mind indulging in a little bit of a story, I don't know, like take committee's time. But when we were learning all this and they're saying, you know, the message of coming out is making it easy. And it is through those golden nuggets one presenter called of moments when you're talking to a customer and they give you a piece of feedback to do with how you improve your service. I had exactly that experience myself. So I experienced the service, which I wasn't happy with. And I took the time to phone uh, customer services and explain why I wasn't happy. Customer service is brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Gave me a solution that I was happy with. And then it transpired that the reason why we'd had this breakdown in customer experience was that I had missed a piece of crucial information. And it was buried somewhere on a different digital page, which I hadn't taken the time to read, I'll be honest. And then the customer service person said to me, you're right. You're not the only one. We have lots of calls about this. To which I then said, well, just as a suggestion, you might want to feed back to your service improvement teams or your decision makers or your managers that a way maybe for a win win for both the customers and your organization is if you could move that piece of information to a place where it could be seen. I said, and then that way I get a better service and you get saved all these calls. And the person on the end of the phone said to me that that's what we're here for. So my reaction to that, having just gone on conferences and hearing, I've just given you a golden nugget piece of feedback. And you don't feel empowered to take that away and be able to improve the business, both for yourselves, but also for the customers. So I took that back in terms of, and that's what they're telling us in terms of how we then need to respond as an organisation and provide a service. We need to find that way. So when somebody talks to a neighbourhood services officer and says, this piece of information is in the wrong place or a sign's not right, that that's fed back and we do those service improvements. Because when those households fill that surveying to say whether they feel listened to, that's the bit that hopefully will make a difference to see that improvement. So moving on from that story, and I don't thank you for that. Um, the sector leaders, the feedback that they gave us um, was the same thing. It's about engaging with tenants every day. It's capture that information because it's so valuable. As my experience showed, the fact that it is the day job for every single team. And we're great in terms of formal structure and we're proud with our formal structure. We have these groups, we have TACT, which is involved in the governments, and we are very proud of that. But it's for those people for whom that doesn't fit how they want to share their views. That's what this plan is about. It's about finding an easy way for people who, who haven't got the time or for whatever reason that may be, and there'll be a whole range of them, that 
impact won't be the place they want to be. Filling in a survey won't be the place they want to be. Maybe even reading Facebook may not be the place to be. So it's having that complete range. And I think we're missing that bit. I think somebody already said in terms of corporate, we're missing that informal bit at the moment to make that easy. That's what this plan is about. The other thing we need to improve on is feeding back. So it's that when people have told us how to improve, that they feel um, that it's been listened and they know how that's been taken forward. We do feedback, but we don't here to do that in a way that is effective. That's what we're finding. So people say to us, oh, I never knew what happened about that. We think, well, we did go tell you and give you the information, but obviously not in a way that you've heard it. So that's something we need to look at. Being honest and transparent, um, keep it simple and human language. And the, obviously the most important thing is about talking to all the tenants, not just those um, on scrutiny and panels. So the other thing that came out of the tenant conversation was the level of respect. Um, and that was quite strong in terms of, you know, they felt sometimes they weren't respected by who they talked to. And that, again, isn't a Winchester thing. That is something that came out um, from the national work that the government did. It was in the white paper, that importance of giving respect. And also the issue around ownership and accountability. and what came also out of the groups was the council um, is seen as being able to respond very well when things are quite straightforward but when things are complex that's when they find it's more difficult the customers feel that they don't get the answers or the feedback that they need so it's looking at that and having the trained staff to be able to respond effectively so in terms of various improvements, so this is our plans and this is where we're interested in your comments in terms of whether you think we are going to fill that gap. Um, in section 4.6, so it says find that way of collecting information from frontline staff and find, making sure that's used and then obviously feeding that back to the person who's told us. Doing regular customer care calls, that came out of COVID um, that people expectations were um, increased because they felt contacted uh, by the council when they had the care calls. The issue for other providers is that now those expectations have raised and those calls aren't continuing, satisfaction has fallen for, for providers. So we're looking at doing, as I say, a customer care call, just saying how are things, um, how we target that and how we frame that, we, ha we haven't sketched out exactly yet. Contact with all new tenants within 12 months, same thing. When new tenants come along, they get a lot of information. So then going back in 12 months and having a conversation and seeing how things are going and learning from that. Um, there will be some tenants that we don't talk to at all. Um, so, you know, all officers buying into making a couple of calls to tenants who we don't hear from just to check how things are going for them. Text messaging survey, something that's quick, hopefully again, reaching those younger generation. That's um, something we want to look into. Coffee, cake and a chat, which came out of the tact conversation as a good way. Uh, a program of going around the district and going to where people already go. So not asking them to come to us, we will go to them and focusing on groups where um, of, of who we don't talk to at the moment. Just have a conversation again. Um, and leaseholder and right to buy satisfaction surveys. So that programme around the district, again, it's got to be mapped out, um, but that may be, I know we've talked to, about going on a Saturday to the local supermarket and just saying, are oh, you a council tenant? How are things going? Um, so again, it's finding those, those routes. And we'll ask the tenants as they've asked us um, for suggestions on where to go. Um, so really, uh, hopefully those are the ideas which will help us address the gaps and raise satisfaction with people feeling they've been listened to better. So I shall leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Jim? Are you happy? No? I think Councillor Ferguson has a comment on that and 
I, I think I'd rather take questions on, on the paper and do that afterwards. And if I may, Chair, I'm sorry, I, Mr Tate asked one more question, which I, I didn't address, and I, I like to make sure I haven't missed anything. He questioned whether why this draft strategy wasn't at Cabinet Housing. And of course, that this is the scrutiny committee while things are in development. So because the strategy is currently in a development stage, it is only right that it's a business and housing policy committee, which is the subcommittee of the scrutiny committee, because it's at this point the draft strategy is being scrutinised, which is why it's here, Chair. I apologise that I didn't cover that before, Mr Tate, but I, I would like us to do questions on this and then we can do the social housing paper I think we, uh, presentation. I think we better. So, so um, Councillor Perkins, just to confirm, because um, uh, there was that same sort of discussion over the housing strategy paper, which we agreed um, being a strategy paper was definitely for this committee um, and and it will go in due course to um, I think, um, the housing cabinet, we, we, we said next municipal year. So on that basis, now this one's called a plan rather than a strategy, but I agree with you that it's very much in the first instance for this committee. Are you saying that after TACT have looked at the final draft, that you that it's still intended to take it back to housing cabinet as uh, to to sort of confirm it as a procedural paper or the underlying framework uh, will be um, agreed at that stage. Um, yeah, you know, can you just elaborate so that we're all clear as to whether it's only this committee now and the representation that they were able to make to this committee that will be heard, or whether it will be another bite um, at the cherry in due course. Um, thank you, Councillor Bronk. I'm actually going to defer to our strategic director with responsibility to ha for housing, Mr. Hendy. Um, it does actually say in the paper that it will go from here for sign off with our tenants because it's a tenant engagement plan, which was the anticipation. But because it's in draft, it's why we're getting the scrutiny element. But Mr. Hendy may wish to comment more. Yes, thank you. Chair, I mean, in the in the report at uh, 4.8, it sets out the next stage is on the on the back of um, this discussion this evening. I'm also conscious you've already discussed the housing strategy. And clearly, this would be an integral part of the housing strategy in relation to the council's response as a landlord and how it operates. So that could be picked up as part of the housing strategy in the future. But it's if you wanted to, it's within your remit for to take this report separately at a future CABCOM housing, if you wanted to, that exists. Um, thank you, Mr. Handy. Um, my, my my view is that um, once we've we've done it today and we've been through tact, we then feel it's appropriate to go to Cabinet Housing Com, then that's a decision that can be made. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for that. So um, I think now if we move on to uh, member questions for Jeanette and Julian or Councillor Ferguson if needs be. Councillor Horrell. Um, Chair, I have several, if I may, I'll ask a couple and then maybe prevail to ask some more in due course. Um, Chair, there's one thing that was said this evening that I think I fundamentally disagree with, and that was um, that it's the responsibility of the whole housing team um, uh, in terms of engagement. And it is absolutely, but it's actually a responsibility of the council. And in the last week, I've experienced something with the tenant where one silo of the council did not work with another part of the council, the housing team. And so I hope in this process we can engage other departments right across our responsibility where they engage in other ways with our tenants and can feedback because that level of um, understanding, that level of knowledge is sort of falling between um, two stalls as it were at the moment. So I would encourage wherever we can for this to be an effort across other departments where they interact with, with tenants. And I hope that that can be included. 
Um, and the other piece is broadening out. We talk a lot about tenants, but of course, we have many different types of housing now and we're growing. We've got shared ownership, we have leaseholders. So we need to make sure that our conversations where appropriate, engage with those other communities who might not be the classic, <laughs> in inverted commas, as I say, may say, council tenant, but they are um, residents of our accommodation in other ways. And I think we need to reach out because many times there are interactions with those other communities, in particular um, uh, uh, developments, and that will be important. So a couple of points, Chair, to ask whether they could be included in this. One, reaching out to the broader council community, not just housing, and also making sure that we are we able to embrace those other uh, residents who are uh, linked to us in a very meaningful way. Thank you, Chair. I think, I think these are, are picked up in um, paragraph 4.6, maybe under the first and the last bullet point, but are you able to provide a more detailed response, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, you're absolutely right that it was one of the debates we all had actually in, in one of the conferences. What, what term do you use, tenants, residents? Because obviously, as you say, there's shared ownership. The leaseholders are specifically highlighted within the plan, um, but the actual plan itself is called. And so, yes, I mean, that's a, a discussion um, that we could have how we better highlight the fact that everyone is included in that. I'll have a look at it and, and take that back. Um, and I think I'll be interested outside of the meeting to hear the circumstances around the other uh, engagement with the other council department to understand what can be done there and how we incorporate that. Can I also take the opportunity because I failed to answer one of the points about the independent review. Is that all right if I just inject? Um, so yes, we are having an independent review. We, we're uh, talking to Housing Quality Network about that. But the councillor Fergus is absolutely right. We had a conversation with TACT in terms of how we wanted to approach that because TACT were interested in a review themselves, um, which might have been decided on whether we wanted to do two separate pieces or whether it could all be together and who was involved in that and the different organisations that were available that could be asked, such as TPAS. Um, but at the last TACT meeting, we did a survey as well with all involved tenants to get their views on that, exactly as Councillor Ferguson said. Um, but we have agreed that we'll just do that one piece um, but obviously that will involve conversations with, with tenants, which will be independent from obviously the council. But they, obviously the organisation will have that remit, but they will be looking at exactly um, giving us a health check, if you like, in terms of our approach and where the gaps are. So I hope that answers Councillor Tate's query on that. Mr. Tate, oh, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> sorry, show my age, sorry. <laughs> Oh, oh, yes, Councillor Ferguson. Um, can, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Councillor Hall, for your for your comments. Um, I just wanted to add that absolutely. I mean, I when I when I think of um, tenants, I think of them as residents within our accommodation. Um, but it, it is that difficulty around what word because we don't mean all residents but we do residents of our accommodation and, and the point about the engagement and very much that, that point that um, Mrs Palmer makes about those golden nuggets, you know, that not just that engagement across the council, but also where there is learning that may influence what we're doing in the housing. Then if that's going through a different route, we wouldn't want that to be lost because it may be that they aren't talking to a housing office. They might be talking to someone else in a different department but it has a ramification for housing. So I think that understanding that and how we incorporate that and how we make that real within the council is a is is a is a good point. Um, thank you. Before we return to Councillor Horrell for your remaining questions, um, Councillor Brooke uh, has a question or two. Thank you, Chair. Apologies, I missed Councillor Horrell's question, but coming on to what your answer was there. I'm assuming it was more about the wider council and I was going to bring in um, 
in where I am in Denmead, the white wings, you said it tends to be younger people who are generally happy in white wings. Um, there's a whole lot of older people there who are very unhappy um, and they tried to run a barbecue there last summer and only five of the residents came along because as soon as Winter City Council is mentioned, they can't be bothered. Um, the reason for that is exactly as you say, it doesn't matter how much effort you've made in the housing team, they were told there was going to be a polling station in their lounge and it didn't matter how much they argued, that polling station was put in their lounge and it's completely ruined that relationship. Um, so it was just a, this is great putting this together, but it really does need to be the, the treating them with respect piece absolutely needs to be across all of the services that the council provides to them. Otherwise, no matter how much effort time you put into this, it's not going to work. Uh, Councillor Kermoyson, and then we can go to, back to Councillor Hall. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the paper. I can tell from the paper and also the way you've talked about it that you really get some of those key issues. Um, it resonates with me that the, the, one of the problems is getting young, the younger groupings, the younger demographics and the family demographics to uh, engage. And there's a pretty obvious reason for that, which is you know, younger people tend to be out and about and doing stuff much more than older people, and uh, you're much less likely to find them at their home. So, I, and I think you've identified that that's a problem, and that I think you're starting to talk about sort of how do you go and meet them. That's the right thing to do. Is is you've got to meet people where they are, whether it's in the pub or whatever. Um, I'm not sure you're going to get full support for. Uh, a lot of sessions in the pub, but, but uh, the principle of meeting people where they hang out is is and make it easy for them is is resonates with me. Um, I think the problem of gathering the golden nuggets um, that's common to all service organisations. It's not a council thing alone. Um, so it's common to the commercial world. They struggle with understanding the customer um, in commercial world they prefer to as, as customer relationship management and they always struggle with getting the full picture of everything that's going on and to pick up on the points that um, Councillor Horrell made around it's it's the whole council is the service organization and if we and, and it has a brand and if if stuff that's happening elsewhere damages the brand it will affect your relationship the housing team's relationship so so that makes sense to me. Um, uh, and, and it is really hard sometimes to gather those golden nuggets. I mean, your story was fantastic. It's a great example of how sometimes the internal incentives can end up being counterproductive. So how do we overcome that? Um, so I've rambled on a bit here, um, but, but um, I guess there's a question in relation to those two things. The question in relation to engaging with that, those younger demographics is, and, and I apologise if it's in here and I just haven't picked it out and retained it in my little brain, but what do you see as those top two priorities for how, for, for how you're going to start? Because, you know, when you're starting to do these things, you have to expect that the first time you try will fail. Um, but if you learn from that and then come back with a different thing, that's great. So I'm just wondering what are those top two priorities that, you know, you would go out with now and say, right, this is what we're going to have to do. And we're going to try that for a while, see how that goes. And if that fails, then we're going to try something different. Um, and then in relation to collecting the golden nuggets and really understanding and acting on them, what key difficulties do you see doing that? And, and as you were talking, I was thinking, Oh my God, GDPR! You know how how do you know as a councillor if I hear something, how do I feed that back in about an individual person? Am I breaking privacy rules? You know, I, I think I know how to get around that, but but what are those key difficulties? Thank you. Uh, great questions. Um, the the top two priorities, I think this is probably from a very personal thing, so others might have a different view, so apologies if you do. Um, but I think those systems 
to collect those face to face pieces of, of feedback are really critical. I think that's my first pri my first priority and then going to where people are. So finding those routes, having those days outside the local supermarket um, and just have starting those conversations. So I think that they are the two pieces of areas of improvement which I'd, I personally would like to focus on. In terms of the barriers for collecting that information, it's a matter of consent. So you, we're going to need to train those who are going to have those conversations to understand. We're going to have to have a system to, for them to bring it back and then obviously feed back to the customer. But if you have the consent of the individual, so if they say something, so for instance, when I was on the phone to that person and said this, I'm, I'm not going to go away now and fill in a survey with that suggestion. So what was needed was for that person to say, well, that's, that's actually really useful. Um, do you mind me I'm reporting that to whatever? Can I take your email address and maybe let you know what they say? Yes, and if you've got the consent of the individual to say, and uh, people are clear in terms of how that information is going to be used in terms of a GDR, perhaps that should, we'll obviously look into the details of that, but that should protect that if that individual is giving you consent to take that away and then discuss how they want that feedback. I think it's going to be how what unwieldy is this going to be? That I think is going to be one of the issues we won't understand until we start it. How many, how many are we going to actually get back? You know, in terms, and it will probably start as a trickle and then may build. So that goes back um, to a chair attacks point in terms of resourcing. You know, if it's 10, 10 bits of information a year, we can probably manage that. But if it starts becoming 10 a day, then that's a different kettle of fish. So that's when we would have to look at it again um, in terms of resourcing. So I think the GDPR won't be too much. I think it will be the understanding of the people having those conversations and training them and then going back to people to make that work, to make it show as a difference for individuals. They've got to feel they were listened to. So taking that piece of information away is only part of the process. It's going back and saying, do you remember you told me about moving this piece of information? Well, we've changed it. It's now on the front page. So hopefully we shouldn't see a problem again. I think that's critical, is that closing the loop back. It's better to do that really well for some or your initial thing and then start scaling rather than trying to do it badly for a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mikhail Sahoral, did you have another question? Um, uh, two, um, Chair, in 2.6, um, you uh, ably summarise the feedback that um, for the meeting earlier in the year, where there were some suggestions in terms of um, engagement options, but I don't see those all filtering through. So um, my question is, have you decided to eliminate some of those um, for various reasons? And then, um, my other question really uh chair all of this is w wonderful um and to be embraced but actually tenant satisfaction comes from the service being tip top absolutely first class and i know i don't think i'll be embarrassing our tech representatives but they've been saying to us for ages things like our out of hours service is not up to scratch you, you let us down, it doesn't work properly, it doesn't flow through. So in terms of the service delivery, we have to make sure that some of those elements that are crucial to the well-being and the view of tenants work as best we can. They're never going to be 100% accepted, but that they are absolutely first class and that we listen to what we're being told so that those service delivery elements um, can be enhanced because that then flows through to other views about the council and activities and we're forgiven sometimes if something doesn't quite work out or all the like because they know that we've tried our very best. So a couple of points there chair in terms of the engagement and then secondly um, to ensure that in all of this we get the key principles of our service delivery at the at the height of our game so that our tenants are reassured that um, um, uh, we're doing our very best on their behalf. Thank you. 
Councillor Fergus. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll let Mrs Palmer answer the question around engagement because I, I, I felt that we had incorporated those elements into the plan, but you, you know it more intimately than anybody I would, I would suggest. Um, just around that first class services and out of hours, um, we have already instigated a review of our out of hours service and we're looking at the options on, on that. And that is again in response to listening to our tenants, listening to their feedback, taking that information and responding. So that's ongoing. Um, and also just a comment, you know, within the HRA budget that was passed at full council last week, the key thing there, those growth options were about improving our service, making it even better for, for tenants in some specific areas. One area we highlighted there was being more proactive around issues around the health of homes, and that was a damp and mould issue. So absolutely, we are committed to creating the very best service for our tenants, as they rightfully expect us to do. But we need to hear from them to help us improve. And that out of hours review is in direct response to listening to tenants and saying we need to look at this. And in fact, the response to Christmas was key, key on, key on that. Um, Mrs. Palmer, do you want to address the whether we've missed anything from our last tech meeting? Um, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Yes, Councillor Hall, which bits been missed? The only thing that probably isn't really highlighted is the event, which was called the conference. We didn't want to use the term conference because when we surveyed um, tenants about that, that was a word that put people off. So we started calling it the event, didn't we? And we haven't come up with a term we, um, yet. So I think we put something about um, specific uh, events focused on specific events and the cost of living. I'm looking for it here, sorry. But the, the other bits, the new homes is there. Talking to elected members is there, but it does say members. And when I read it myself today, I thought maybe we ought to put councillors because that, is that oh, sorry, like it's, is that the, the bit you think isn't clear? Um, oh. Chair, if I may, um, conference or not, whatever the terminology, there was a loud voice from the tenants that a gathering of some note um, was um, hugely supported. Um, so I think that is probably uh, in need of some further emphasis. I, like Mrs Palmer, didn't really take out the elected representative um, councillor piece as loudly as I think uh, we can be helpful to you because we're all approached in our um, wards when we have issues um, that tenants need help with. And, you know, we can be a voice um, feeding information back and hopefully some of those nuggets. So I think some of the things in 2.6 maybe want, uh, we need to make sure they're flowing through as effectively as possible, Chair. Thank you. I just want to come back on that. Yes, yeah, so what I do is I change, at the moment it says members, but I would change that to, to councillors. And the, it's referred to as the one-off community event is the way that's particular. Okay. So, so, so perhaps if you just undertake to to go through and provide a sort of a, a cross reference. OK, on the yes, yep, I can do that. If Julian yep, has yep. Or, um, uh, Simon re re reviews that just to give us the assurance that so uh, they think it's, it's done sufficiently, I think that should just round that off. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, Councillor Isaacs, you have a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, it's very warm in here, isn't it? Um, yes, a quick question in relation to um, third party contractors, particularly on the repairs team. Um, the most common complaints that we've received is in the plumbing department. Um, have we got any provision or any plans in place for how we monitor that and improve if service falls below par? Um, I've had about five complaints recently, um, the latest one being an of an 83, 93 year old lady actually, who was there for six weeks uh, with a leaking newly fitted boiler. Um, he would come out five minutes, gone again, I'll be back in a week's time. And it was just, it's on the system that an engineer is attending, but he comes out for five minutes and disappears for another week. How can we, if residents are feeding this back in, which they were doing, 
And the only reason that they've come to me is because they've reached the end of the line, really, as to how far they can progress it. One of the tenants, even when they rang up and spoke to the, not the councillor, not the, not the council but, um, officer, but it was actually somebody from the company, in other words, this plumber's boss, said, oh, yes, he's rubbish. He should have been sacked months ago. Um, <laughs> How can we, as a council, improve on poor service delivery in that instance or those instances? Because it's not a one off, it's kind of a repetitive and it seems to be plumbing that's hit the, the most. Councillor Ferguson. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Councillor Isaac. I, I think this is a good point you're making. We're very much talking about our our officers and our engagement, but obviously we do know within our property maintenance we do we do have third party providers. And I wonder if Mrs. Knight, you you want to say because we do we do monitor their work, but if the feedback isn't coming to us as a service, what how do we how do we address address an issue like this? Thank you. Yes, we do monitor contract performances. They will have certain standards that they have to meet. Um, as Councillor Ferguson said, our tenants are our eyes and ears, so we should be very receptive to any complaints that are brought to us through our, our, um, our housing hub. We, um, Andrew Palmer, who is the service lead for our property services, runs daily um, reports um, around performance through a robust um, IT system and we also have our own housing management system which will um did I say the wrong name did I what did I say oh sorry I mean Kingston <laughs> um apologies um and he and he will he runs regular ports on a daily basis so we should be taking that up with the um contractors and we have this year introduced a compensation policy, a very robust one for tenants. So there will be penalties around that, that sort of missed appointments and not turning back up. So I hope that helps a little. Um, thank and, you. Um, if I may, Chair, um, Councillor Isaacs, um, I think if you have a specific case, the key, the key thing is to pass that up to Mrs Knight so she can she can look into it. I think that's really important. Mrs Knight, would that be all right if I send you the four cases recently, just to see if they have actually been followed up following the tenants' complaints, because they've all ended up coming to me. It's been resolved, but I'd like to, I've never had any feedback afterwards as to what happened after that. So I'd really like to know if that was actually followed up with them. That would be really helpful. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Isis. I think, I mean, it's useful for us to know that as part of a communication plan that we're talking about here, that that type of escalation, um, it, it does need to be addressed. But um, if we take the remainder of the discussion about those cases offline, but um, I, I, it was disappointing to, to read that tenants should be shown respect. And I think maybe, you know, when you read that currently, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's referred to as a headline as opposed to well, one of the concerns is, and, and that it's not right. So, you know, that that's, you know, I think part of the um, problem you know, with, is great to have the honesty there, but it's just, you know, the amount of contact sometimes that's, that, that's needed. Um, I think we've done, or just uh, discussed a, a, a great deal um, by way of questions. Are there, were there any other sort of comment by way of debate that people just wanted to add that they've been saving or can we move on to the um, the presentation on the housing white paper? Briefing on that. OK, um, I'm happy that we can move on then to the uh, housing white paper briefing, the supplementary paper that was distributed um, to, to come under this agenda item before we move swiftly or um, deal with the, uh, the work programme as a last agenda item. Chair, can we just say we've got a bit of a gremlin with the big screen. Um, I can share it and so it will be on the public record and, and on the live stream and it will be on the screen in front of the chair um, but I can't get it on the big screen um, if it if it helps at all it, I mean it was published with the papers it's on page 
81 of of the packs. Um, people can perhaps follow along that way as well. Thank you. Just apologies for the members of the public at the back, they will struggle to um, follow the slides through. Thank you, Matthew. The, the presentation was really just notes for um, sort of explaining a little bit more about the, the white paper and what I'm going to discuss today with just some sort of action points under some of the work that um, we have that we've already conducted. Um, but I've been asked to brief um, on the chart on the social housing white paper today. And the social housing white paper or the chartered for social housing residents was published in November 2020. It covered seven key themes of importance to the everyday lives of residents. The white paper made a big splash in regulation, engagement, complaints, safety and antisocial behaviour. Headlines included a greater role for the regulator of social housing and the housing ombudsman, open publication of performance against standard metrics, the tenant satisfaction measures and publicity of landlord complaints. A slide two, please. The sorry. the social housing white paper followed the tragic tower block fire at Grenfell in 2017, and an in-depth government review of failings and a wide consultation with the social housing sector revealed five themes for further action. And these were published for further consultation in a New Deal for Social Housing Green paper. And they were ensuring homes are safe and decent, effective resolution of complaints, empowering residents and strengthening the regulator, tackling stigma and celebrating thriving communities, expanding supply and supporting home ownership. The long delayed white paper was eventually published, as I mentioned in 2020, and it set out wide ranging and compulsory changes to how social housing organisations operate. And the themes from the green paper have been redrafted and expanded into seven themes with further specific policies, measures and an enhanced role for the regulator for social housing and the housing ombudsman. The impact on the social housing sector cannot be underestimated. Not only are operational activities and performance measures under increased scrutiny by the regulator, there are also new requirements for resident engagement and complaints. There is a greater emphasis on safety, resident voice, performance monitoring and home ownership, backed by a risk based inspection regime from the regulator of social housing. Overall, the seven three themes in the social housing white paper all linked by one common thread that the safety, well-being and voices of social housing registers, residents is paramount. And it's down to landlords to demonstrate engagement and performance to their, red, to their residents. The three themes should, oh, I'll read them out because they're not on the screen, are to be safe in your home, to know how your landlord is performing, to have your complaints dealt with promptly and fairly, to be treated with respect, backed by a strong customer regulator for tenants, to have your voice heard, not just listen to Lim, but heard by your landlord, to have a good quality home and neighbourhood to live in, to be supported, to take your first steps to ownership. And theme one, to be safe in your own home. In the years since Grenfell Tower fire, many of the building safety issues have already begun to be investigated and addressed. Theme one focuses more on rebuilding trust in building safety measures and ensuring residents feel safe and are feel safe and are safe. Building and home safety is an explicit part of the redesigned customer regulation standards. There will be consistency in safety measures across both the private and social rented sectors with mandatory installation of smoke and carbon monoxide alarms and an increase focused on electricity, electrical safety. Landlords will need to engage residents on safety issues. Two way balanced engagement leads to trust, which is key to feeling safe. We are required to produce and action a residents engagement strategy to share safety information and allow safety concerns to be voiced. 
theme number two to know how your landlord is performing, which we, we've touched on. A key point of um, controversy in the green paper was the idea that landlords should gather standardised key performance indicators, KPI metrics, which would be presented publicly and, and in league tables. For now, there's no suggestion of league tables, just more accessible performance information. So KPIs are back on. As Janet, meant, as, as Jeanette Manet, meant, Mrs. Palmer mentioned, the regulator got it right. The regulator developed a set of tenant satisfaction measures (TSMs) which landlords will have to gather. They will follow the themes of the white paper around properties being in good repair, building safety, engagement and neighbourhood management, including measures on antisocial behaviour. Theme number three: to have your complaints dealt with promptly and fairly. With the Housing Ombudsman's Complaints Handling Code having already been published and in force since January 2022, the focus of this chapter is on a strengthened working relationship between the Ombudsman and the regulator and the actions landlord must take to increase awareness of residents' right to complain. The long criticised demographic filter where residents must go through a designated person or wait eight weeks before taking their complaints to the Ombudsman has been removed. The Ombudsman's Complaint Handling code, code will help ensure consistency of complaint handling by landlords and also put greater emphasis on learning from complaints as a route to service improvement. Complaint handlings will be sped up and the Ombudsman give powers to take action against landlords who are increasingly slow or unreasonably slow in handling complaints or are slow to provide information to the Ombudsman for them to review escalated complaints. The regulator, the Ombudsman and the government will lead a centralised awareness raising campaign of social, of social housing residents' right to complain and the routes, and the routes of objection, objection open to them. Landlords are also required to publish their complaints process, both on their websites and more widely, as well as raising awareness themselves of the complaints process. Theme four, to be treated with respect, backed by a strong consumer regulator for tenants. This, th this theme is all about the new consumer standards and the return to inspections to accept compliance with them, alongside continuing co-regulation. The, regular the regulator has reviewed the existing customer regulations and the new consumer standards will align with the tenant satisfaction measures and the social housing regulation bill. Once this is approved by parliament, it will give the regulator greater powers to address non-compliant non landlords. I think that's due to happen fairly soon, actually. But landlords will be regulated to self-refer any breaches of the con con consumer standard to the regulator. The cap on fines, which the regulator can impose, will be remo removed and performance improvement plans will be introduced for those failing landlords. Local authorities will also be held to greater accountability for their management of ALMOs and TMOs. Theme five, to have your voice heard by your landlord. Involved tenants should be a key part of any landlord's governance and scrutiny arrangements. But beyond this, residents who don't want to attend formal meetings or join a panel should have their needs identified and their voices heard too. This theme discusses the need to tailor engagement opportunities to residents' needs and interests, encouraging and supporting greater involvement. Jeanette Spina has set out today. The regulator will review if landlords have sought out best practice in resident engagement and involvement and continually improved how they engage with residents. To upskill residents who would like to be more invo informed in, informed or in involved in scrutiny and decision making, a government led learning and support programme will be made accessible to all residents of social housing. To ensure residents are treated with care and receive the correct support from landlords, the government will lead a working group to review professional training and development, including the need for mental health awareness and training for frontline staff. Theme number six, to have a good quality home and neighbourhood to live in. Much has changed since the decent home standards of 2001. Energy efficiency and decarbonisation are now top of many agendas, as are access to green space for the benefit of wellbeing, encouraging community integration through good design and tackling community issues such as antisocial behaviour and domestic abuse. 
This theme considers what a good home should mean and how landlords should tackle neighbourhood issues. The decent home standard is, is currently under view to decide if it needs to be updated. The review will consider energy efficiency, decarbonisation, access to green spaces and access to communal space. Linking back to the tenant standard me uh, measures mentioned in theme two, the specific inclusion of satisfaction and antisocial behaviour handling has relevance here too, with landlords having to report how they are performing in this area and will be challenged on this as necessary by the regulator. The government will clarify the responsibilities of landlords and the police in directly tackling antisocial behaviour so residents understand where to access support and what to expect in terms of a response, including greater clarity around the availability of community trigger or multi-agency ASB case review arrangements. The new regula regulated consumer standards will, will include requiring landlords to have a policy to tackle issues around domestic abuse. And finally, theme seven, to be supported to take your first steps to home ownership. The, the final theme focuses on increasing supply of affordable homes and in particular redesigning the shared ownership model. The new shared ownership model will reduce the minimum initial stake from 25% to 10%, allowing owners to staircase in increments of 1%. Landlords will also now have to cover repairs for homeowners for the first 10 years. I hope that's been a helpful trip through both papers. Um, and as I said at the beginning, you know, it's a, it, it, it is a, a big challenge for the social housing sector. But we're ready to meet it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. It was um, greatly appreciated rather than reading slides. We have an excellent overview, so important information linked to it. So thank you for that doing it that way. Um, are there any specific questions? We were asked on the last sheet, page 91, if you have questions on what we've just been taken through, but being just a briefing, so to speak, and like uh, only if there are you know, um, matters you're really confused by or, or need clarification on at this time. Otherwise, I'm sure we'd be happy to deal with them outside. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Horrell. Um. Chair, we have an outstanding relationship with the police. Um, we had the benefit of that review at scrutiny uh, recently, but obviously there are links here to their support and, and some of the elements that, like county lines that they will be following. Will we need to do something more than we do today to ensure that we fulfil our duties here in this uh, white paper. Thank you. I think we're, we're fortunate in that also sitting within housing is the community safety team. It's very proactive um, in dealing with any of the issues very closely with us as a landlord. We've worked together very well for a long time. We've already um, have the availability of the community, the community trigger and tenants have access that. Um, we have the multi-agency group that deal with antisocial behaviour, street activity. So I think I think we're fairly well placed. We can always do better. But I think we're fairly well placed in the council with the community safety team, and the good relationships we have with the police. Councillor Cromoyson. Thanks for that briefing, um, uh, Mrs Knight. Um, there's a heck of a lot of uh, content in there most of it, which is probably going through most of my head, but um, I guess two questions there, I think. Well, one question really, which of the requirements that are in this white paper give you most cause for concern in terms of our ability, which is the City Council's ability to meet those standards? Um, and in terms of both designing a solution and then secondly, resourcing implications to actually you know, deliver on that on that solution. Thank you. I think as a landlord, you know, we perform we perform very well in in the business as usual type work. So in in how we can how our tenancy team operates and how we how we manage our repairs, which is the most important element to to our tenants. I think the big thing to tackle is a is a culture change, which we've kind of touched on um, with other teams, accepting that 
everybody has a duty around engagement. Um, we're trying to introduce elements where we can make every contact count. And we've tried that in various guises. And so I think for us, it's making sure that everybody listens to tenants. We get that engagement piece right. We learn from where we make mistakes. We do. We, we don't always get things right. We're keen to make sure that we do get things right. It, as Councillor Horrell mentioned, it's about including all our residents and not just focusing on our tenants. Um, you know, the frontline team is very busy. It is, it is continually um, at, at, at sort of top pace trying to keep up together on everything, but we're very good at, at um, putting ourselves forward for best practice examples. We're part of the DAHA, and I'm hoping you're not going to ask me what that means, but the, the new domestic um, um, abuse legislation brought in where it's a best practice that making sure again testing ourselves challenging ourselves that we're doing our best for those people that are, are seeking sanctuary so I, th I think for me managing so many different teams it's getting that cohesion of us working together working in partnership understanding what somebody does here affects somebody there and as I said pr probably culture change around um, organizations and our own offices at times and the secondary part to that was the, the sort of resource implications. You know, is it um, where I'm headed with that is thinking, is this an additional bird, you know, over and above what we do already, which may well be exemplary or at least best in class? Are these introducing new burdens that actually will have resource implications? And that then leads, well, the question, I will take the question away then, was where does that resource come from? But uh, just want your your in public opinion of that. Yes, it will. I think we've touched on the fact that um, you know the engagement team is a small team, um, and so we will be looking at that because it is really important to prove to the regulator that we are talking to all of our tenants. So that will mean, as as Jeanette has said, that is a perhaps working different hours, different days going to where those community events are so there is a, there is a possibility around that we've recently um increased our property services team um due to the building safety uh, legislation that's come in so we have increased that team by 6.5 um, officers and that is really where you know our challenge is at the moment Professor Ferguson sorry I missed your hand earlier um, thank you, Chair. It was actually, I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Hall's question about whether some of the responsibilities within the social housing paper may involve are working with the police more, more, more closely. In fact, the Community Safety Partnership, Strategic Partnership met last week and we had the Police and Crime Commissioner um, representative with us and they were congratulatory on, on the close working that relationship that we have within that community safety um, partnership. So it's also interesting there is additional legislation coming through the community safety partnership that we are going to have to adhere to in addition to this. So I think looking at that in the round is 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 worthwhile um, doing because I can see some synergies between between the the two. Um, uh, Mrs Knight has reflected on the additional resources which Councillor Cromoyson was referring to. It isn't just in the engagement team. There is a lot in here that we need to do. And I think the way this presentation has been put together is to give members confidence that we're already on a lot of this stuff. We, you know, we're aware of the legislation coming through, but we're already proactively seeking to address it. And indeed, um, the community safety trigger, um, which is a, a method by which tenants know they can heighten an area of concern if they've had an issue of ASB, they're able to um, have a community safety trigger where they can review how that's been handled and the impact on them. And actually, the council, unlike others, perhaps has been really proactive in promoting that as available to tenants. And that was something the Police and Crime Commissioner's uh, representative um, complimented the City Council on in saying you know, you've proactively made sure that your tenants are aware they have this means of redress to look at their issues. And that trigger is all about learning. How do we, what do we do? What, 
what could we have done better, not just for that um, tenant who's had that experience, but learning for the future. So I hope the members can be reassured that in this presentation, not only doesn't set out the prison, the, um, the legislation and what's expected of us, but it very clearly says, and this is how we're responding, more to do, but we're already on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, before moving on to the um, work programme, um, I realised I've made a few annotations. I just need to, for formalities, ensure that we address the requirements of the, the agenda item for um, item seven. Um, but what I wanted to make specific reference to on was, was page 58 makes reference to the fact that Winchester City Council is fortunate enough to have a tenant representative willing to give their time to be part of the national panel, um, uh, which is um, you know, the um, uh, national residence panel set up as a consequence of um, the Grenfell tragedy, um, and that they're also um, part of the tenant involvement steering group. Uh, and, and I think I, mean, I just want to endorse the fact that we are fortunate and uh, I'm grateful for that individual putting in that time and effort. And I, I hope the committee ag agree the same um, and would also wish to extend their thanks to that individual for that service. Can I, do, do, do people agree? Do are they happy with my giving that thanks? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm pleased to hear that. Um, the uh, age 52, um, the recommendation was that uh, the Business and Housing Policy Committee um, are asked to comment on the uh, tenant engagement plan content. Um, and obviously during our questions, there was a lot of comment, I believe, but I didn't segregate the, the two lots of discussion. Um, I, I think you know, a, a lot of useful comment was also made on the on the um, on, on the program. So I, I hope that that is um, is 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 agreed, or, and and that um, we can uh, agree to the fact that we have commented quite fully on the tenant engagement plan. Um, and uh, specifically um, support the efforts made to to seek to to gain information from a, a, a wider base. Uh, and and um, I think that that is particularly important, um, and, and therefore endorse um, endorse that effort. Um, so I, um, I I think I've now closed off that. What formality? Apologies for not making it clear. At the right time, I think we can now move forward to the uh, the final item on tonight's business. Um, so uh, thank you very much, um, members of, of TACT and, and Mr Tate for, for joining us and sitting through such a, a, a prolonged discussion. I hope you found it useful and that you're encouraged by the action that uh, has been taken and um, comments made. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. Oh, maybe Julian, if, um, is Simon going to pick up comments on the first slide? Okay. Um, so the, the the work plan is um, on item eight. We turn to our page 93. It's sadly very, very blank uh, for, for the next municipal year. That doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of important activity. It's just that it's not been fed through into the into the work plan for you. So I, I apologise to my successor because, of course, this is my last meeting. Um, I shall not be standing for re-election. Um, and I wish the, uh, uh, the the committee chair next year um, the, the best in the in this role. And that um, uh, I hope that the um, housing and the and the and the business. Portfolio holders and, and uh, key staff will provide us with um, a, a, a work plan that reflects the importance and the necessary papers that need to come through so that we can identify better the, um, the, you know, the problem of resource constraints because we want to have this um, uh, um, task force you know, uh, the, you know, um, uh, established, but in order to know. Um, why 
that might be a problem or the recycling of the housing strategy, we need to know just uh, what other key papers must be scheduled um, uh, for, for this committee uh, and, and you know, for, the, for the workload on officers and, and everything else. So um, we try and ensure that that's populated for um, the next uh, the first meeting in the next municipal year. Um, but to add to this, um, we clearly need to have um, added to it the reference to the housing strategy paper, which is to return, um, and also make reference to um, the uh, feasibility um, and uh, pr uh, proposed timing for both the task and finish group, which um, I think is particularly important on, on uh, for HMOs. Um, and it's been touched on at the end of a couple of meetings now uh, as part of our cycle. Um, and I think it's it, it, it's time now to try to move forward um, the consideration of um, at least some policy tweak to enable showers um, instead of baths in particular, in, in, you know, whether it's desirable to, to have them rather than to say it's our, not our policy to have showers, or, unless very, very specific health reasons necessitate them. And I think that that was the answer that, um, that was given um, um, more than a year ago, um, and it is time we um, look more closely at that. So other than those comments, are there any other pleas for um, any particular papers for the for the work plan or can we leave um, the, the the next chair and the portfolio holders to to populate it for scrutiny by the um, members of the of the next committee? Councillor Isaacs. I don't know whether this is appropriate now, but I've been banging on about it all year, but is there any way we could have it um, Oldsford, in particular as a market town, on the working plan to discuss, I don't know if it's feasible or not, that they have um, residents that have links to work and families have priority over housing within that area? Um, because although we are over uh, the acquired, required population, it is a market town. We don't have that we've got people coming from all over the area and we are losing our workforce because they can't get accommodation. This is something I'm quite passionate about and I know it may not be feasible, but I'd really like us to investigate this, please. Do you want to make any comment on whether that can be? Can, can I, can I, or maybe Simon, can, can you respond? It'd just That's be useful to know we're outside the or we perhaps have a discussion outside the meeting. We're useful to understand the sort of detail of that because clearly, if it's around the allocation of affordable housing, that would be very difficult to do, if not unlawful. Mm -hmm. But if it's something else, then let's have a conversation about that. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Chair. And just um, in response to Councillor Isaacs, I mean, obviously, if it is is around allocation of housing that that's difficult. But if it's a more general point, when we're looking at the housing strategy about making sure that we have homes available for people to live in across the district, the housing strategy is very much looking at you know, all of those elements of, of what we need to do to provide that in line, obviously, with the local plan and everything else. So if it's at a broader level, that might be something we can pick up through the housing strategy and that member briefing that will come once we've got some of those priorities would allow you to voice concerns, particularly around that market town and that issue. But if it is on allocation, then that's a conversation to have with um, Mr. Hendy or Julian Knight. And I don't think that's appropriate for this committee, but. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. I agree as a, it's not a policy level um, matter, but at least it can be touched on um, within the housing strategy as a high level policy. <clears throat> um, if, I'm, if I may, Chair, if you indulge me also, you mentioned the shower issue um, and we are currently um, reviewing heating sources um, with tenants going forward um, in terms of carbon neutrality and energy saving, etc. That's been done through um, a tenants a forum of focus group um, around that area. Um, and one of the issues within that, which was raised, is this issue of we currently have a policy that we don't put in showers. 
But if we're looking at energy efficiency, we're looking at cost reduction, then there's a new driver to look again at that, that policy. So it may be that that policy gets looked at through a slightly different route to influence the wider policy around major repairs. Um, but it's, certainly, it's certainly on the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that assurance. That's perfect news. I, I hope that that shows that the uh, asking for things into the work plan or changes um, have, have been heard. So that, that, that's great. Um, I think then we can now therefore um, agree that we've reached the end of the meeting and thank you all for your participation. Um, and I'll call the meeting closed. Good night.